Intel's marketing struck gold in 2008. The Core i7 branding would become one of the most enduring successes of the PC world, synonymous with the best CPUs you could buy. To more cynical observers, the coming of the i9s, first with the Skylake Extreme CPUs on the X299 HEDT platform, and then with Coffee Lake Refresh on desktop the following year, marked the end of that success, sacrificing the i7's brand reputation just to sell a bigger number. That being said, Coffee Lake has proven to be holding its own in 2023, and 8 cores and 16 threads are still nothing to sneeze at. Could it be that the i9-9900K is more than just a number? The i9-9900K still feels brand new to me. I can still remember the reviews, even though it just passed 5 years old. And honestly, a CPU of this spec still wouldn't look out of place in a high-end system going into 2024. Some of the best gaming CPUs of today have 16 threads, though how they get to that number can be less direct. The 14 nanometer process node, here in its fifth iteration, was only retired after the 11th gen. In fact, the near-identical i7-11700K is still available to buy brand new in some places. That shouldn't suggest to you that the 9900K is still cutting edge, however. Since the 12th gen, Intel have moved on to 10 nanometers, with big little core combos and larger L3 caches bringing some much needed performance benefits. Even AMD, who in 2018 were very much behind Intel, have made incredible progress in the last half decade, with even smaller lithography and even bigger caches than Team Blue. While the 9900K stood out in its day for its combination of threads, clocks and IPC, the world has moved on since then. I wish I could say the same for the second-hand CPU market. I paid more for this i9-9900K than I did for a brand new Ryzen 7 5700X, and there are any number of superior CPUs available for a similar price on the new market today. But if you built yourself a top-notch PC with one of these in back in 2018 and want to know if it can still stand up in 2024, or if you can pick one up for a song, then I think it's worth putting through its paces. The test rig consists of a Gigabyte Z390 Aorus Elite with 32 gigs of DDR4 4000 and an RX 6900 XT. The RAM is only running at 3200CL16 because I couldn't get it to run any higher. 3600 got as far as the Windows home screen, and 3333 got all the way into the OS, but crashed after a couple of minutes. My RAM isn't exactly B-Dye stuff, however, so if you're fortunate enough to have better quality chips, you may find you get a small advantage in CPU-limited situations. The i9 itself is being kept cool under a Cooler Master 240mm AIO, which actually did a pretty decent job of keeping thermals under control. I seem to recall the 9900K garnering a reputation for being a bit toasty under load, but there was no danger of thermal throttling during my testing. I should point out though that this is the second motherboard I tested this CPU with. I originally had an ASUS Z370 Strix with the latest BIOS revision, but apparently its VRM couldn't handle the i9, and so the CPU throttled in synthetic tests. If you have a Z370 and are thinking of getting this chip as an upgrade, you might want to think twice. This isn't a great start. I didn't expect the i9 to really beat the i7-8700K in Valorant, as the game doesn't value cores as much as it does clocks and cache, but I really didn't expect the 9900K to lose to the older Coffee Lake chip. Because it's not possible to guarantee which map you're on, I tend to take an average of three games, and maybe this time I just got a bad rotation, but the 9900K scored an average of 333 and 1% lows of 187, only 2% slower on average, but 10% worse than the 8700K at the bottom end. Of course, let's not overblow things, it's still a good result and more than enough for most people. Fortnite was a little closer to what I expected. This is a different season to the one I tested the other CPUs in, so it shouldn't be compared too closely to the others in the chart. The average FPS is pretty much on par with the 8700K at a little over 300 FPS, 
but lows are substantially better. You can expect a nearly rock solid 144 FPS lock, at least unless you get unlucky with the stutters. The last DX11 esports title is Counter Strike 2. Here, the 9900K comes in a little under 10% above the i7, averaging 250 FPS with lows of 124. CS2 also doesn't leverage all the available threads, but it's a good measure of single core performance. The older 14 nanometer quad core i7 doesn't look too shabby by comparison, considering it was running 500 megahertz slower, but the Zen 3 CPUs show how far modern architectures have come in the last few years, with the Ryzen 5 5600X and R7 5700X both coming in about 20% higher than the 9900K. Onto DX12, and again, Call of Duty Warzone shouldn't really be compared to previous tests. It's a new map after all, but it is still the same engine, and the average of 154 FPS makes sense in context next to other CPUs I've tested in the past. While we're on the subject, I have to admit my tolerance for this game is faltering again. It's a pain in the ass to lose access to stuff I earned in previous chapters, and hearing an American voice doling out missions just sounds jarring for some reason. I knew from other people's tests that Starfield has a certain preference for Intel CPUs, and that certainly seems to help the 9900K stay relevant here. Despite being a couple of years older, the Coffee Lake chip is roughly on par with the Ryzen 5600X, and only about 10% or so behind the 5700X. As an aside, I noticed ETA Prime showing off his Starborn armor the other day, so I thought I'd keep up with the Joneses and load a newer save than usual for the capture footage. The FPS is basically unaffected. If it weren't for the presence of the Ryzen 5700X, I'd have sworn that Cyberpunk was still being GPU limited at 1080p medium. The 9900K scores almost identically to the 8700K and the 5600X at 114 FPS on average, with 1% at 73 and 0.1s just under 60. However, the 5700X is there, holding an 11% lead over the rest. Still, it might make sense to drop to 720p if I test anything higher end than this in the future. The RT result is even closer, if anything, averaging just over 60 FPS compared to the 5700X's 64. Once again, it's a pretty tight race between the Coffee Lake chips and the Zen 3s in The Last of Us. While there technically is a few points difference in averages, in reality it's going to be hard to tell the i9's 106 FPS from the Ryzen 7's 115. The only real advantage the i9 has compared to the previous i7 is in 0.1% lows. The 9900K seems far less prone to stutters than the 8700K in this one. And, as usually happens when someone says the word stutter, up pops Jedi Survivor. Once again, the 9900K is functionally pretty close to the newer chips in pretty much every aspect, being within 10% of both of the Zen 3s, and point ones are equally as atrocious, as we've come to expect by now. I was... A little puzzled by Flight Sim, my first run at the same settings as usual scored in the low 60s, somewhere below the i7-8700K. I certainly wasn't GPU limited, in fact the GPU was underclocking itself. I set a minimum clock speed in the Radeon control panel to correct for this, but it did absolutely nothing for performance. After a few runs, I think I just have to accept it. For some reason, the i9 scores 63 FPS about 5 frames less than the older i7. Civ 6 at least wouldn't let me down. It's another title that doesn't care much about how many cores you have, but it does at least seem to appreciate the extra cache of the i9, 
The AI turn time benchmark completed in an average of 6.21 seconds per turn, about 2% faster than the i7-8700K. Sadly, still about 1.5% behind the Ryzen 5700X. But I guess you can't always overcome progress. Onto the productivity tests, and I was quite pleasantly surprised by the 9900K in Resolve. Not only did the 4K timeline play back very well in the Edit tab, it didn't struggle too much with the text transition either. The render time is the highlight of course, completing the 5 minute clip in just under 14 minutes, sandwiched neatly between the two 5th gen Ryzen's. And it's a similar story in Blender. The 9900K really shows its worth compared to the previous gen flagship, completing the classroom scene almost 3 minutes faster than the 8700K at just over 7 minutes 8 seconds. In fact, it's only less than a minute slower than the Ryzen 5700X, which I think is a pretty good result considering the competitor from AMD at the time was the 2700X. I'd say it's a pretty impressive showing all round from the first desktop i9. It doesn't really account for itself much in gaming, and owners of the i7-8700K probably shouldn't be falling over themselves to upgrade if all they want is more frames in CS2 or Fortnite, but for productivity it's a very healthy step up. I'd reiterate a couple of points from the start of the video. One, I don't think this was an earth-shattering introduction to the i9 brand. If they'd called this the i7-9700K and skipped the non-hyper-threaded model we got in the real world, I don't think anyone would have cared all that much. If it were my shout, I'd probably have saved the new numbering scheme for the next process shrink. Though, as that didn't end up happening for another three generations, I guess I understand why they may have gotten a bit impatient. Secondly, I want to repeat that, unless you can get a really incredible deal, I wouldn't buy one of these. At all. Like, at least in my local market, you could get a used 5700X and a motherboard for the price of this chip alone. In fact, if you insist on Intel, there are a couple of pretty amazing LGA 1700 CPUs that fall into the same price range. Sure, they have fewer performance scores, but the much higher IPC should more than make up for it, and the e-cores are also there, I guess. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.